Hi, and welcome. Hi, thank you so much for joining us. This is really great. I'm so glad you could do it. Yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Yeah. Um, I'm Laura Brody and the, the founder of Opulent Mobility. For description purposes, I am a middle-aged Caucasian woman with brown hair in front of a full bookshelf. And I am welcoming Julie Forbush. How did you find out about this to get involved in Opulent Mobility? Yeah, so I pretty regularly scour the internet for different opportunities that fit my work. Yeah. And uh, I've been living with a disability my whole life. I have a genetic disorder called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Mm. And I just felt like this was a great fit when I looked at the other work that was yeah. in the previous shows. It is. Your work is really stunning. Um, you can see little bits of your work in the background, all the quilting and the quilting machine. Um, do you want to talk about what got you into that? Yeah, uh, I went to art school for college. I did a bachelor's degree in uh, general fine arts, which mm. in my degree program, they have you do two different disciplines. So I did okay. a combination of painting and uh, sculpture, but I focused on sculpture with textiles. Nice. And that uh, eventually translated to uh, interest in more traditional like quilting practice. So what was it about fabric that really called to you? I just love it as a medium. I like the movement of it and the colors, yeah. the way that it's something that's so common in our homes and in our lives yeah, that people don't give a lot of thought to. Was that just something that you had always worked in or just had always been drawn to? I actually didn't start working with fabric until I was in college. I started out doing an English degree, a strong interest in literature and writing, and professionally, I'm a technical writer. Okay. But I was really pissed out doing my degree program, so I started sewing as oh. a hobby to take pressure off and then kind of flip and I started Eat. sewing more serious interesting you just found it like more meditative or I found it more freeing and creative fabric has a lot of tolerances things don't have to be perfect they don't have to be square you can take the pressure off and just improvise really nicely yeah I really love that I, I'm a costumer by trade Amazing. and got yeah. skipped aside. So I'm a big fan of the squish factor of fabric. Yeah. Um, some of the images that you have in your work are just really striking and also a little bit hard to see. Can we talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. For me, my work is about surfacing the things that are difficult to talk about or maybe deeply personal. Yeah. And it can be a struggle to express in day-to-day -day life or to find a context that's appropriate to share with other people. So having the work um, be difficult to look at or difficult to visually parse is an intentional choice because it is like emotional burden of sharing mm -hmm. something that is hard to discuss. That's what I'm trying to represent. Nice. I'm going to share the screen to show your pain banner. You can see it, but it's just, it's a little bit disguised in there, almost pixelated. Yeah. This one, I love the format of the pennant as this thing that's used for celebrating, like party bunting or yeah. sports like you know supporting your team with that shape but the things that have been formative in my life are equally weighted toward the good and the bad you know yeah. I've been living with chronic pain since I was in my late teens wow and it's just something that is so deeply ingrained in my experience of existing in my everyday relationship with my body that the average person, unless they have a similar experience, can't connect to. Mm. But it really has shaped who I am as a human being and how I interact with the world. So the idea behind the format of this piece is kind of dealing with how difficult it is to discuss those things and also giving kind of appropriate respect to the fact that this is a formative thing for me. It is like... Yeah a celebration of who I am, but the parts of it that people don't really want to look at closely. And that's so much when you're talking about disability, right? Yeah. All of the things that we don't necessarily want to pay as close attention to, or I don't know, maybe out of superstition that it might happen to us or whatever it is. But yeah, I think there's a real fear or discomfort with speaking deeply on those kinds of topics. Well, how do you choose your fabrics? Uh, that's an interesting question. I love used materials. Oh yeah. So my favorite thing is to go to the thrift store and buy used cotton bed sheets. Oh, nice. Or in some of my work, I've used my own bed sheets. I okay. 
there's a real sense of intimacy and like closeness with the body that comes from those kind of gross gritty materials yeah and I uh I've literally used thrifted bed sheets to make quilts where I'm like cutting around a pea stain or a blood stain and I mean I wash it obviously but there are things that you don't want to do (laughs) yeah um I dye the material usually to get some more interesting depth of color or sometimes if vintage sheets and stuff will have more interesting patterns that you can use in interesting ways yeah what kind of dyes do you use I use a uh, Procyon dyes primarily. I also paint and sometimes mm. I have a friend who is a printmaker who will sometimes Ooh. do like photo transfer onto the fabric for me. That's, really That's great. So what kind of images are you doing that? Is it not necessarily intended to have those images be front and foremost, but in the background? Yeah, I think it's equally intended to be obscured. So nice. My friend, uh, Cecilia Mignon, incredible artist. Look at her work, at their work, excuse me. This is a lot of florals, a lot of architecture, things like that. Hmm. So perfect for what you're doing. There's a really good matching of the kind of imagery and interest that we have. Yeah. So was there something about quilting in particular, that idea that really spoke to you? I really love assemblage and like the idea mm-hmm. of the bricolore kind of gathering lots and lots of material. Yeah, and that's what it does in bits. It's also such a storytelling medium. Yeah, Uh, my first exploration of not quite quilting, but making a blanket Mm -hmm. was a piece that I did in art school where I took a pre-made blanket and applied letters onto it. So the idea was an insecurity blanket as opposed to a security blanket. That's awesome. (laughs) And I always wanted to return to that and I didn't quite have the kind of technical skill to do it at Mm -hmm. that point yeah so I learned traditional quilting just as a hobby and then I started learning how to make letters and improvise letters and that really got me back to that essential idea of a security blanket do you feel like you're getting to the level that you can tell the story you want to tell with your quilting now I feel like I've developed the right level of technical skill I spent about two years like during the height of the pandemic, that's when I was really quilting the most and had a lot of time to dedicate. Yeah. I feel like now the work is where I'd like it to be. Nice. No, I think uh, Ira Glass had a whole thing that he was talking about with that, that when you start, you have great taste, but not necessarily great skill. <laughs> and that, that you can tell that your work isn't up to the level you want it to be, but when you can get there, it's like that now I can use these tools to tell the story I want. Yeah, exactly. That's a a perfect way to say that. And you've been doing this since college, but was there something before that that was really like more of your medium? Yeah, I actually, I went to a performing arts charter high school and I was a musician. I played all kinds of different instruments. I played guitar from the time I was eight years old until I was about 18 and I took voice lessons. Neat. Is that something you still do? Uh, It's something I would love to do. It is like one of the first things for me that surfaced that I had a disability or something was going wrong with my body. So my hands were really the first thing to go. And I don't have a lot of manual dexterity in my fingers anymore. Are there other instruments that you can use or want to use that work with the way your hands are now? Not so much. I mean, I've tried a bunch of different things. I, um, as a kid, I played violin and trumpet and marching band, and I played bass and guitar. I took piano lessons, uh, yeah. really a little bit of everything. But they all really rely a lot on finger dexterity. Yeah. So, yeah, I can see. But that's it's interesting because you've chosen something that is at least also a little bit about being <laughs> dexterous, but, yeah, may, but it is more forgiving in some ways. You know, all of my choices in art medium at this point are accommodations. Um, Makes sense. Yeah, I used to be a more realistic, like hands-on um, or more able to. Like that was never my passion, but I could do more realistic drawing and painting when I was younger. Okay. And I moved away from that as my hands kind of got worse and worse and I had more injuries. But now you can also tell the stories without having to have them be that that hyper-realistic or anything like that. 
Yeah, and I am really interested in writing as a medium too. So the marriage of like text and textile is where yeah. my best work lives, I think. That is wonderful. And also just a great term, the text and textile. Yeah, I really abuse that in my artist statement. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. But it's there's a poetry to it, I think, that when you're putting words and that people pay different attention to the words in an artwork. Absolutely. I think some yeah. yeah. Written word has a type of authority where we're used to seeing this, at least works in print, where you're yes. giving them the sense of authority and truth of information. And I think sometimes on the internet too, especially with like live captioning, that gives it a sense of um, more power, some you know, for better or worse, frankly. Yeah. And the kind of sense that the visual typeface gives you is yeah. really different based on how you present the letters. So I've played with really uniform all caps in some of the typeface yeah. really influences the sense of authority that a text has. Yeah. So I've worked with uniform, like all capitalized letters in some pieces and in the piece pain, like that's a more squishy, lowercase, sensitive way of lettering. Um, Do you have like fonts that you prefer, I guess, for lack of a better? Um, Yes. Like what I prefer in graphic design, I mean, I have an undying love for Futura. I have a tattoo in that type of like my favorite. But for my work, I really lean toward something imperfect and improvising. So mm. when I make each word, I usually I feel like a rough sketch, but I'm not big on measuring or figuring out what, what the dimensions are going to be. Mm-hmm. I just cut strips, like one or two inch strips, and kind of go with the flow of how the letters feel like they should be. And nice. Song, I just remake it. It's a great way to do it. And also, I think you get the stories. Do you do it as layers or do you piece? I piece, yeah. For those of you who are not familiar with that, piecing means you're actually sewing the individual pieces together, whereas you can applique. That's another option for layering on top. So. Applique is gorgeous. I just always, my eyes get frayed. I'm not good at it. You know, everybody's got different ways that they prefer, I think. I like your setup. Your work setup that's really nice have have you been finding like there's certain ways that just make it a lot easier for your hands and for more of the accommodations that you need like some different equipment or yeah for me um really adjusting like the chair and table height is the most important thing Mm. yeah especially when i'm actually doing the quilting like the top stitch portion where you're binding three layers of sandwich together Mm mm-hmm what do you find is a better level for you? Does it need to be at elbow level? What do you need to do? It needs to be as close to shoulder height as possible so that I'm not putting too much strain on my neck and back. Got it. And I also, I'm just gentle on myself and I really only do straight line quilting. Like we're not messing with complicated stuff at this phase. No reason to. I mean, you're telling the story you want to tell and you don't, there's no reason to make it just swirls unless you, you want to. <laughs> Yeah, we're letting the piecing speak, which is because I don't want to do anything fancy. <laughs> you know, I mean, sometimes you can come up with a, a justification for that. <laughs> like, That's the main yeah. thing I learned in art school is you can justify whatever choice you have to make. And also, if it, do what works for you, I think, is the best one. Yeah, like having something that you made with your own hands based on your inspiration yeah. is better than having something that exists in your head that's perfect. Exactly. Of course, because that magic little moment in your head, unless you're putting it onto something, nobody else gets to to experience it. Exactly. Yeah. Do you have places that you would like, ways that you would like your art to be shown or places you would like to show them? For me, I think what's magical about art and when you interact with it is when it's a little unexpected. Mm -hmm. Like when you encounter it um, kind of randomly in your day. So I think Textile is another great opportunity for that because it can live really easily in someone's home. Yeah. And I think there's like magic to that, to that really intense handmade art object, just Uh living as a quilt on someone's bed. Like that really just does it for me. No, that's great. I I can even see that as an installation being a really neat one of building a room of these, these pieces. That's sort of a lived in thing. Yeah, I would love that. 
Oh, that'd be so cool. Okay. Um, where are you located? I'm in Oakland, California. Okay. Um, I wasn't sure. I didn't know if that was something that you could do and come down to Los Angeles for this, but um, obviously really happy to have your work here. That's great. Yeah, I'm going to try and make the opening, actually. I have some friends. That would be great. Oh, we'd love to meet you in person. That'd be really cool. I mean, this is this is nice because a lot of times the artists are all over and frequently for health reasons, they can't necessarily make it. So it's really good when people can. Yeah, I would love to. Oh, that'd be awesome. And do you have any shows coming up or anything that people should know about? Yeah, I do. I have a show in December at Blue Line Gallery in Roseville, which is near Sacramento. Nice. It's uh, 30 for 30. So it's artists making 30 pieces in 30 days. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I'm about halfway through. So the challenge ends two weeks from now. And I'm actually making paintings for this one because it would be insane to do quilting that quickly. (laughs) I think that would be a mess. Ooh, that'll be neat. What's your topic? So it's kind of the similar use of text and bright Mm. like neon clashing colors and geometric patterns. Nice. I started making those kinds of paintings as sketches for the quilted work. And Makes now sense. Fully their own thing, so that's what we're doing. That's really great. Oh, very cool. And how can people find you? I'm on Instagram as Saint Failure, and I have a website that's saintfailure.com. So, also, what is Saint Failure? Just for people who are not familiar. Sure. Because this is great. Uh, I when I was first dealing with my diagnosis of EDS and really had lost my ability to make a lot of art, like I was just physically Mm -hmm. in a bad place. I started writing a lot more and I published a collection of poetry called Prayers for Saint Failure. Oh. And this is just all about like, what do you do in your life when everything has disappointed you? You can't rely on your body. You can't rely on maybe the people that you thought you could. Yeah. I was really at a place of having lost everything. Mm. And out of that, there was a sense of like, all right, but I'm still here. Yeah. So like, what do I do with that? Wow. That's kind of, yeah. That grew into figuring out how could I still make work? Mm -hmm. How could I still have some kind of career that mattered to me or that at least let me make art and figuring out like what my next direction was going to be so saint failure to me is this idea of you have no choice about a lot of things that happen in your life yeah but how you respond to that and like what you choose to do from there is really revealing of who you are and like what you could be yeah and what what has happened to the saints? <laughs> That's actually a really great way to approach it. And how we approach failure in our lives. That it, it can actually be growth. Yeah, exactly. It's like, you have to fail. You have to try. Yeah. You have to make the imperfect thing to get better. Yeah, because otherwise you don't learn anything. If, it's, if it all comes that easy, there's not a whole lot of push. And I think that that's the real test for who we are as humans, you know, not the things that only come when it's light, but what comes when it's hard. Yeah. And I think especially for those of us who are living with disability and confronting those things, whether we want to or not, yeah, like there's no path of least resistance open to us. No, you don't have an option. The option is you live with it or you don't. Exactly. So... And you are making something, making sainthood out of the failure (laughs) and making beauty. So that's really fabulous. And just a big part of why Anthony and I felt your work was so appropriate for the show. So I'm so glad you could come in and do that. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm really excited to be a part of that.